part two of Momentum. I'm gonna do today, Pastor James will finish this up next week. And I'm just gonna go, just gonna start right into this, okay? I wanna talk about something that I've been unpacking my whole Christian life. I'm still unpacking what this means. Can you give me just a little bit in the wedges, David? Just a tiny bit, or more, maybe more out front. And that is this. Uh, I've got some scriptures to read, but you don't have to turn to them because by the time you get to them, I'll be done. So let's just get right into this. Psalm 119.68 says this. <clears throat> you are good and do only good. So teach me your decrees. It's a fancy word for ways. Teach me who you are. Teach me what you do. They're decrees. So I want to take us on a little journey for the next few minutes. Not going to talk very long. Actually, that's not true. I'm going to talk really long. <laughs> no, I'm not. What is the goodness of God? It's a good question. And if I went across, I'd ask everybody, what's the goodness of God? We'd get, oh, four, 500 different answers. And that's okay, probably should. But let's talk about the goodness of God and getting some momentum and forward movement in our lives. You'd like that today? Yes. I think I would. I think all of you would. Some of you need it. So let's just get down to the basics and then I'll share some heart stuff with you, okay? But we gotta talk about the basics first. So the goodness of God is an unchanging attribute of who and what God is, okay? It's unchanging. He doesn't change his mind, in other words, if he's good or not. He just is, okay? It's a virtue, it's everlasting, it doesn't change. I know uh, as a father, and now as a grandfather, but especially a father, you wonder how on earth does God do what he does with his children? Because remember, there's no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. We're all kids. We're all sons and daughters, somewhere along the line. And you wonder, how could God still be good in all this mess? We've got to drive him crazy. Think about it. How many complaints have been made in this room alone just last week to God? Just in this room alone. How many times? But see, his virtue of goodness doesn't change like we change. We're like, would you stop complaining, please? He doesn't do that. He's a good father, he politely listens and says, okay, are you finished? All right, now let's move on. An attribute is something he is, not just something he does. Okay, an attribute is something he is, it's not something he does. Can be. God does because he is. God does good things because he is good, all right? An example of that would be omnipotent. Who's heard of the word omnipotent before? You've probably sang it before. Yeah. Means he has all power, which means he has all power to be good, okay? I'm just setting this up with some goodness here today. Who needs some goodness today? I do. He has all power to be good. Another attribute is he is infinite. I know, fancy words for some of you. Some of you are like, oh, don't. Infinite means he cannot be measured. Okay, look at the sun. Well, don't technically, literally look at the sun. Don't do that, because then you'll come back and say, he told me to look at the sun, I burned my eyeballs out, now I can't see. Then we'll have to stop the service and pray for you. The sun's light can be measured. 
So it's not infinite. It looks infinite, but it's not. God cannot be measured, so what could we say? He's infinitely good. He's infinitely good. God does not change, but he changes us. The goodness of God. Now this is, again, this is something I've been unpacking my whole life. And really just within the last year, I've really been digging on what's the goodness of God. So I'm gonna try to wrap a whole year into this. I think I can do it. I've done it a few times. Okay, the goodness of God can be summed up like this. Every good thing you can think of about God, that's his goodness. Okay, so let me just give you a few that I came up with. His mercy, his kindness, forgiveness, healing, discipline, that's a fun one. Prosperity, abundance, his glory, just name a few. All those attributes are his goodness. Those are his goodness, okay? So when you say the mercy of God, you're talking about, yes, he has mercy, but you're also, that's wrapped in his goodness. He's merciful because he's what? You can say it, it's not a trick question. He's forgiving because he's what? He prospers us because he's what? Here's a fun one. He disciplines us. <laughs> That's a fun one, kids. Hey, nobody likes discipline of the Lord, and that's a separate, that's a whole, that's a whole nother sermon right there. I think I could use just a little bit more up here, David, if you're back there still, or wherever he went. He may have raptured. I don't see him. Well, okay. So just remember that, that when you talk about any good attribute of God that's not changing, that is his goodness, okay? Everybody getting it so far, pretty easy? Yeah. We must remember one of Satan's biggest jobs and joys is to get us to doubt the goodness of God. It started in the garden. He gets you to doubt when I, now from, okay, I'll should back up. From now on, when I say the goodness of God, put it in terms of all the attributes that I said earlier. Mercy, love, kindness, goodness, discipline, all those things wrapped up, okay? So when you put all those things together, one of Satan's, our enemy's biggest jobs and joys is when he gets someone to doubt the goodness of God in any way, shape, or form. Did God really say is his favorite term for us? Did God really say he would do such and such? Did God really say that to you? And here's the fun part about that. He most of the time uses people to speak for him. It's not a voice that just comes out of the thin air. It's a person that will come to you and cause you to doubt the goodness of God. They will cause you to doubt your calling. They will doubt you to, they will cause you to doubt your church. They will cause you to doubt what God wants to do in your life. It's all questions about the goodness of God. Not facts, not what? Facts, say that word with me, facts. Those are not facts, because they're wrong. They're questions. Did God really tell you he would do this? Did God really say he would do that? Remember, Satan is, I don't even like to say his name, but I guess we have to sometimes. I mean, let's say it this way. Let's say our adversary, our enemy. Does that sound better? Because I don't even like to say his name in this room. He doesn't, he doesn't deserve even to have his name spoken. He's so low. And he's done so much damage, golly. 
He is the author of bad. If you wanna know what bad is, look at him. He's the author of it. Everything bad that happens is because of him. Everything bad that has happened will happen in some way, shape, or form is because of him. He brought sin, death, murder, sickness into this world. And guess who has to live with it? We do. Now we do have the blood of Jesus and we've got the goodness of God. Don't we? But what happens if you're in this room today or me or someone watching by streaming and you're in that place right now where I just said God or the enemy will cause you to question the goodness of God and you got a lump in your throat because you have been. Not because you don't like God. It has nothing to do with loving or not liking God. It's because there's a system of darkness that is unleashed on this planet that is so strong if you don't surrender to the goodness of God and believe the goodness of God to, moment, to put your momentum and push you ahead, you'll start to believe the very lie that, that God does never, never wanted us to hear. And that is, did God really say that if you eat of that tree, you will surely die? We were never supposed to hear that, never supposed to have it, and never even supposed to be a problem. But it is. It is a problem. And God knows that. And he's so good that he will come to the rescue. I got a few questions here. If something bad happens and we say, where was the goodness of God? That's common. I mean, that happens. But we have to remember is when we ask that question, we have to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't put the goodness of God into events only. Does everybody hear that? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Because what'll happen is if something bad happens or something good happens, well, that's God. But what about the bad? Well, see, we put it into an event and not into his character. The devil wants you to question God's character. Above all things, he wants you to question God's character. Did God really say he would do this? Did God really say that he would rescue you? Did God really say he's faithful? Is God really merciful? I don't think so. He wasn't merciful to me. That's our adversary speaking. An event could be just the byproduct of his goodness. You get a new car. Oh, ain't God good. Well, yeah. But so are people. Maybe, some, maybe someone bought you that car. God told them, hey, help them with that car. Okay, but what happens if you lose that car? Is God still good? Huh? See, you're putting his character into an event that happened to you. You can't put his goodness into events. You have to put it into his virtue, his unchanging virtue. Events do not change the goodness of God. To his church, to our country, to our government. Listen, guys and gals, governments have been around for a long, long time, and there's been a lot of good ones and a lot, a lot of bad ones. There's been a lot of bad kings, a lot of evil kings. God knows what to do with it. Don't worry about it so much. It's okay. His goodness will reign. Can everybody say that with me? His goodness will reign. Not the current future governments. People are not that strong. God's way too big and too powerful for anybody to shove him around and tell him what to do. Does everybody hear me today? Does every dark thing hear me today? You're not strong enough for our God. 
The event itself may not have been good. The event itself, the event, what happened, may not have been good. But that event does not take away the goodness of God. Again, that's right. Again, his goodness is a virtue of who he is, not just what he does. Can you remember that little piece the rest of your life? If you would remember just that today, if you would walk out of here today and say, I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to question whether God is good for me or not ever again. If you can do that, that's a win for me. That is a win. It's a win for the kingdom. It's a win for you. It's a win for your family. And it's certainly a win for your kids and your grandkids because you'll start declaring the virtuous goodness of God over your kids and your grandkids or your nieces or your nephews or whoever kids are in your life for future generations. And I have done that. I have paced back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, time and time again. And I claim the goodness of God over my children, my grandchildren. And then I say, their kids, kids, as kids, as kids, as kids, as kids, as far as you want to go down the line, your goodness will be for them just like it is for me. And when you start believing the goodness of God, the doubt of the enemy will start to flee because you'll begin to realize his strength is not that strong. It's only as strong as I give it. I should say it this way. He is only as strong as I give him the ability to be strong in my life. Let me say it that way, it's better. Let's have God's kind of goodness, God's kind of goodness. Not the world's kind of goodness. The world's kind of goodness does not last. It's fun sometimes, but it's shallow. Good friends are good, and they're needed, but they're not good like God. But what's even better is when that friend will allow the goodness of God to speak through them. Can we all be that to each other? Can we try that? Everybody in here, can we just try just to speak good things for a week? (laughs) Some of you are like, oh dear God. Now see, I'm not, I'm not trying to be ornery here, but if that's a fight for you, that's, that's a problem. Yes. Yes. I'm not trying to be ornery, I'm not trying to hit you in the gut. Well, yeah, I am actually. I'm trying to hit you square in the gut. Have you ever seen someone get hit square in the gut before? Not in the movie, but like really square on. You know, they can't breathe. That's what I like. The word of God does that. Those fights in high school. Did you ever see a good fight in high school? Oh, we flocked to them, guys. We didn't run away from them. We're like, fight, fight. The fun part is shoving people out of the way because you're still in the fight. You're just not really throwing the punches. So try that this week. Really try that this week, and if you can't remember to do that, do one of the most old-fashioned things you can think of and tie a string around your finger. (laughs) Seriously. For you young'uns in here, that's how us old'uns remember stuff, is you put a string around your finger, and every time you see the string, you remember, I'm supposed to speak nothing but good this week. Wives? But you guys are good anyway. Husbands, nothing but good to your wives this week. I call that sweet nothings. Put a little sweetness on there. Honey, well, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. 
I've got thoughts coming to my head that would be great for a men's conference, but since we've got ladies in here, nah, you can, you, you know what I'm, yeah. Husbands, show goodness to your wife this week. Wives, show goodness to your husbands this week. Everybody you talk to, here's nothing but good. That's gonna be tough. In our nation right now, it is hard, hard, hard to hear anybody say anything good publicly. It is, it's hard. And you get caught up in it. Not on purpose, it's just human nature. Unless you remember the goodness of God and the momentum of the spirit that he puts in you to say, I can't, I can't. I can't do that. It's a standard of the spirit-filled believer that puts boundaries up and says, the goodness of God has been too good to me. I, I can't allow myself to get involved in that. So let's turn this a little bit. John Piper says this. John Piper says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. That's true. How many of you are breathing today? You can put your hand up. Obviously, that's not a trick question, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you are breathing today? That's the goodness of God. That's his goodness. He's so good, in fact, that Paul even says in Romans 8, 28, how many of you know Romans 8, 28? If you don't, I'll say it for you. He works, God causes all things to work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So he's so good, even Paul says, he works everything. Say that word with me. Everything for the good. Everything. How could he make a stubborn, run-down, old rust bucket car turn for the good? Because you're eventually gonna get a different one. That's better. That's good. He turns everything for the good. As a matter of fact, he's so good that he's good even when we don't think it's that good. That's true. Amen. In the late 1800s, there was a young lady born, her name was Amy Carmichael. She was born in Ireland. And from her earliest years, she wanted to be a missionary. And being born in Ireland, she, she was born with dark brown eyes and dark brown hair. And she prayed every day, because she got teased for it, that God would change her eyes. And of course, he never did. So she wanted to be a missionary, and uh, actually what, what made her want to do that was a guy named Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor is like the forefather of missionaries. And he, she heard him speak and she got a burning desire. She really wanted to go to Asia. And so she tried four times to get to go to China because he talked about China a lot. And the denomination she was with wouldn't allow her to go. So she had it burning in her so much that she decided I'm gonna just switch denominations <laughs> so that I can go. So eventually she went to China for a few years, did some missionary work there, but she got ill with a condition called neuralgia. And if you've never heard of neuralgia before, it's, it's long and complicated, but basically it's, it's excruciating pain and a lot of fatigue. So she had to come home. She got better. So then they said, well, why don't you try Japan? So she went to Japan, same thing. Her illness kicked in, she had to come home. She's very disappointed. And um, finally, someone said, well, you know, I don't think they have <clears throat> many missionaries in India, why don't you give India a try? I said, okay. So she went to India. <clears throat> While she was there, 
she began to adopt babies, baby girls and baby girl toddlers who were being sold into, I have to watch, to trafficking. Let's put it that way. Now we have to put a little thing here. This is an epidemic everywhere. So we don't wanna just say this country because every country deals with this now. But back then it was awful in that country, in India. So she began adopting these babies, toddlers, they were girls, began to adopt them and she started an orphanage there. And time went on, it grew and grew. As a matter of fact, she got started getting support from all over the world. Queen Elizabeth was one of her greatest supporters. She got lots of them and then they would grow up and then they would go rescue girls and bring them in. Now how this worked is she would, being from Ireland, she got coffee grounds and she'd put coffee grounds on her face to darken her skin so she could fit in with the, with the people there. And one day as she's doing this early on, she looks in the mirror and she sees her brown eyes, dark brown eyes and dark brown hair that she asked God, get rid of these. And he didn't do it. See something, and and, and the orphanage is still going to this day. Still to this day. She did it for 52 years. See, something that she thought was bad was actually what? It was good. What do you have in your life now that you think is bad? But God actually says it's not bad, it's good. And you've neglected it and neglected it and neglected it because you don't think it's good. What we do is we compartmentalize ourselves in ministry and we say we, you can only do a certain amount of things in ministry. Preach, sing, play. And if you can't do one of those three things, then you have no giftings or abilities. And I think God would say, What's, that's, that's not my goodness. That's not my goodness. You're asking that I take something away that I put in you that's actually good. She just ha- you just haven't used it yet. She didn't get to use her brown eyes in Ireland because everybody had blue eyes. Everybody had blue eyes. Everybody in her family had blue eyes. She's the only one in her whole family and in her entire school that had dark brown eyes and dark brown hair. Everybody else had bl- blue eyes and brown hair or blonde hair. And she would look at herself and say, how is this good? But look what happened. She rescued thousands and thousands and thousands of young girls that would have been sold into something awful and life-changing. What do you have inside of you that you say, ah, that's not of any use. I don't think that's useful. I don't think, I don't think that would give our church any forward momentum at all. I just don't think it would. How do you know? How do you know? Some of you in here have, and I mean this respectfully, you have the gift of gab. That's a gift, by the way. Being able to talk to people, that's a gift from the Lord. Because I can tell you there's some people that run as far as the east is from the west if they have to talk to somebody. But see, you think, oh, God could never use that. Are you kidding me? He gives you words and phrases to say and a boldness to stand firm in your faith to help someone who is literally dying and being sold into some kind of a slavery. And you have words of life. As the word says, you have the words of life. And yet you don't think that's good enough. My eyes are brown. That's not good enough, I want blue eyes. 
And so you feel as though you're useless in the kingdom of God because God's not using you. And he's like, I've given you, I've given you something. You're not using it. You know what it is. As Pastor Steve said a few weeks ago, and I loved it, he said, why do I do those things? You know why you do it. It's the same thing with, with what the Lord has entrusted inside of each one of us. You know what you have inside of you. So when I ask you, what do you think God wants you to do? And you say, I don't know. Yeah, you do know. You have a message. You have a testimony of the goodness of God. Or you wouldn't be sitting in this seat right now listening to me. God has done something good and miraculous and powerful in your life. And you just sip your lip as if nothing happened because you don't see it as good. Amen. And it is good. Amen. Anything God does for anybody is good. And it is life changing. And someone is out there dying, waiting for a testimony from a brown eyed, dark haired person I don't mean that literally. Fits the story. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for your story. I know there's addicts, there's, there's past addicts in this room. There are. Drugs, alcohol, you name it. It doesn't have to just be drugs and alcohol, guys and gals. There's all kinds of things you can name that are addictive. And there's someone out there right now, they don't, they don't know how to say it, but they're saying, I don't know what to do, this is all I know. God, if you're real, help me. God, if you're real, that's where they're at. To us, that's like, well, of course he's real, but I know all of you in here well enough to know you would never think that way about anybody else. Is God real? And how many times have you heard someone's testimony that they were so far down and they didn't know God and that's the only, only thing they could think of was to say, Jesus, if you're real, send somebody. Huh? You don't think that's the goodness of God reaching out to you? What does that have to do with singing a solo or preaching a sermon or praying for somebody from the platform? Nothing. Nothing. That's a gift of God. That's the goodness. That's, remember all those virtues I said? Mercy, forgiveness, loving kindness. He has gifted you with a mouth and breath and probably a pretty good story of getting you out of stuff that was really bad. And you use the word, he rescued me. He helped me. He moved me. He broke something off of me. I prayed that God would get rid of this in my life, something that I didn't think was good. And I looked in the mirror and I saw that what he made was good because he's good. Can you give the Lord just some quick praise? Something, just something. Not for me, just, it's just a moment. Thank you, Jesus. I wanna end with this. <clears throat> I see Damon back there. We went to lunch a couple weeks ago. We were talking about our favorite story in the New Testament. And it's one of those that you can just keep unwrapping because you find different stuff in it all the time. And that is the father and the two boys. And I found another angle to it. I was like, that hurt, Lord. That hurt. Because it was me. If you read the story and know the story we call it the prodigal son, it's a, it says it's a story about two sons 
really, it's not about the sons. It's about the good father. That's what it is. The boys are in the story. He was, yet, but you have to know who he was speaking to. He was speaking to two different groups of people in this story. He's talking to the tax collectors, who everybody just loved. We'd call it the IRS. No, the tax collectors, were, they were not, they were hated. Because they'd, they'd make you pay what you owed and then they'd make you pay more. But this is who he's talking to in this conversation. He's talking to the tax collectors and the religious law Pharisees of the day. Two sons, two separate people, one loving good God. And as I wrapped this story up in my own life this week, I didn't like the conclusion that I came to because it kind of exposed my heart, I guess. And anytime you're getting ready to come into a message or a sermon and you read something or you grab a hold of something and you're like, man, I have to preach this and that's me. That's kind of where, I, you know, that's where I'm at. It'll either, it'll either dive or it's gonna shine. No, it's gonna shine. Most of us in here, I would say, uh, probably a lot of us, there may be a few, you're not the prodigal. You're not the prodigal son or daughter. You're the older brother. I'm the older brother. You're the older brother. If I say brother, is that okay? I know in our society today, you gotta be real careful with what you call people. So I make sure I don't offend you by calling you brother. Here's a great part about that story. The father comes out to the older brother. And the older brother Hears all this activity going on. If you don't know the story, I'll recap it. He goes and he says, what's going on? And he says, your brother came home and we're celebrating. Because, and and here's, here's the kicker that really got the older brother. We killed the fatted calf. Now see, that, that was a big deal to say. See, they didn't just do what we do with cattle today and just kind of move them through and kill them and say, see you on the table. You know, they didn't do that. A fatted calf was taken care of. There's a reason why it's called the fatted. They fed it a lot on purpose to get it what? Fat! For a special occasion. Something special was what that calf was, was for. He wasn't just squandered because everybody's hungry. There was a special occasion. And so when the older brother heard, oh, they killed the fatted calf for this guy who ran away from the kingdom, he ran away. He's the one that ran away. I didn't run away. We haven't run away. We're out doing work. For who? The father. And he comes back and they say, he's in there. I'm not going in there. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. But what ends up happening? The father, the good father comes out and it says in here, begged him to go inside. And he didn't do it. And what's interesting that Daniel and I were talking about is this is one of the, one of the only parables slash stories that Jesus spoke that he left open-ended. There's no, there's no answer to it. There's no, and the older brother refused to go in, so the father got mad and kicked him out. Or the older brother finally came to his senses too, and he went in and they all joined and they ate this fatted calf together. There's no answer. It's open-ended, which is so much like God. 
to say, you make up your mind. What are you gonna do? And so I finally, I said, I know what I've gotta do. I know what we need to do. We need to get back in the house. If you wanna see the goodness of God, you gotta get in the house. As long as you're outside the house of God's goodness, it can be this house, it doesn't have to be an actual place, it can be a thing of the spirit. But as long as you're outside of the graces of the goodness of God, you're outside of his house. You're outside of the blessings. Does everybody see that? An angry society will keep you out of the house. I refuse to go in there. Now, it can be a church, it can be your own house, it can be with people, it can be a lot of things. It doesn't have to be a particular thing. It wasn't just his attitude that was the problem. When we read that, we go, oh, that older brother, he had a bad attitude. Well, yeah, he did, but that's not, that's not what it is. He was questioning his father's heart and motives towards the younger brother, towards the tax collectors, towards the sinners, towards those who were struggling in their lives. And he was questioning the father's heart. That's what he was doing. He was questioning his father's heart and his father's motives. Came out as a bad attitude, but he was questioning his father. Why does he get to do this? Why do you get to do that? Why does it, I have served you. Woo, listen now, put on your ears of the spirit, you who have been serving for many, 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 many years. I have served you my whole life and you never gave me a party and you never gave me the fatted calf and you never celebrated me. But this son of yours comes home. Oh, it's all great for him. But what about me? See, he's questioning the father. What about me? What about me? What about my gifts? What about me? Can't you show me some goodness? And the father says what? Son, it's always been yours. It's always been yours. Everything I have is yours. Always has been. I gave you brown eyes and dark hair for a purpose. The giftings are irrevocable. It's always been yours. But we had to celebrate because you had a brother over here that was hurting and he was hurting and dying. We had to celebrate because he got to his senses and he came to his head or he got his head right, I should say, and he came back in. But as for you, just come back in the house, please. And I'll show you how good I am. Stand up with me. He's gonna show you how good he is. You will see the goodness of the Lord, as Psalm 27 says. We will see the goodness of the Lord. Why? Because it's already yours. The goodness of the Lord, everything that he has for you, everything he has for me, you don't have to beg God there's no begging with a father. Matter of fact, Jesus said, how many of you, if your son or daughter asks for this, you're gonna trick them and give them that? If they say, can I have a piece of bread? And you give them a scorpion. Now that's a very big picture, but he, and he, he painted a ridiculous picture to show what a ridiculous thing to say. How many of us in here, if our children wanted something or needed something, we go after the younger one because they were stupid. 
I'm not gonna ask how many of us in here have been stupid when we were younger or we had children that have been stupid. <laughs> All the parents are going and the kids are going. Hey, listen guys, gals, everybody in this room has been stupid. We have all done absolutely ridiculous boneheaded things. But what happened? God's what? His what? His goodness rescued us. His goodness. How many of you as parents or grandparents or, or maybe, maybe you don't have children of your own and that's okay, but there's people in your life that are dear to you and if they came up and said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling, I need something. Do you think you could help me, dot, dot, dot? I think the picture is we go to God like that and he expects us to go, yeah, get on the floor, roll around for a while, scrape the carpet, <laughs> beg me, and I might think about it. Would you ever, ever do that to your children or your grandchildren or kids in your life that you love or even just people? No. Is that the goodness of God? No. That's how people get treated outside the house because they're not under the covering. The younger son was not under the covering of the father when he was eating with the pigs. Which, by the way, another side note, education-wise, when he said the son went and ate with the pigs, that was like major, major disrespect and honor for the son to go eat with pigs. Because pigs were unclean. And in some ways, for them, it still is. But to say, not only did he eat with the pigs, he ate what the pigs wouldn't eat, major, major dishonor thing to do to a father. Probably the most dishonorable thing he could have done was eat the pods that the pigs wouldn't even eat. See, it's a picture. It's a picture of the goodness of God that you need, I need. My last scripture, Psalm 23, six says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Literally means, the word follow me means, it literally means absolutely and certainly. With certainty, he will follow me. He's gonna run after me. He's gonna run after you. You just gotta turn around and let him catch you. I don't wanna outrun God. I don't wanna outrun his goodness and his mercy and his loving kindness. So today we have some prayer people. If you'd wanna come forward, that'd be great. <laughs> and there's two things. One, of course, if you need prayer today and say, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm, this other, I'm this older brother or sister and I need to get back in the house of God. Remember, the house of God is not what I, I don't mean a building. I mean, I'm, I'm far from God. I have allowed my culture, our culture, I've allowed the news, I've allowed people who do not speak the truth to be my truth. And I, I gotta have that broken off today because I can't live like this anymore. I gotta get back in the house. And maybe that's you today. But maybe you also need, besides just getting someone to pray for you, maybe you don't need actually someone to pray for you. You need to come up and spend time with God and just say, God, I need you. Just like we sang today, right, John? We sang, I need you, oh, I need you. We're gonna push the chairs back so there'll be some room up here. So make sure when you come up, you filter as quickly as you can to the left and to the right and make room for people to, to get some prayer today, okay? 
Father, thank you for your goodness today. We recognize who you are. We recognize this is what you do. <clears throat> we recognize, Lord, that we need you. We need your goodness. We need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. But more than that, we realize that we don't want to be like the older brother in question and question and question, but we want to just run into what is already ours, what already belongs to us. We run into that today, God. We need you. We need to get back in the house. We need.